This video explores TLDP, a brief therapy approach with a focus on relationships and the cyclical maladaptive pattern, or CMP, with an emphasis on empathic exploration. TLDP stands for Time Limited Dynamic Psychotherapy, and counselors use this model with patients who are experiencing repetitive, troubling patterns in relationships. TLDP is informed by interpersonal theory, attachment theory, and emotion-focused change theory. There will be a Q&A session with the therapist, Dr. Tisdale, at the end of this video. In this role play, Jay is the client, so please pause the video to review his background. There are a number of key principles to keep in mind regarding the TLDP model. People are innately relational. The maladaptive pattern originates early. The pattern persists in the present. Clients are stuck, not sick. The therapeutic focus is on shifting maladaptive patterns interactive processes, and one main relational pattern. The therapist is both participant and observer, and change continues after termination. Selection criteria for TLDP clients includes the capacity to reflect on relationships, willingness to examine feelings, emotional discomfort, the capability of connecting with the therapist, and consistency with appointments. A key element of the TLDP framework is the cyclical maladaptive pattern, or CMP, which is defined as a cycle or pattern of negative self-evaluations of the client that often lead to problematic interactions with others. The CMP involves five main features acts of the self towards others, expectations of others, acts of the other towards the self, acts of the self towards the self, also called the introject, which will be discussed later in this video. And finally, countertransference reactions within the therapeutic relationship. The length of TLDP treatment, or therapist-client cycle, is usually 26 sessions, and this video will cover three sessions in total. The first, the second, and then session 13, which represents the midpoint in therapy. In the first session, Dr. Tisdale invites Jay to discuss the problems that brought him to therapy and some of the relational dynamics that have proved challenging in his life. Well, um, good morning, Jay. It's nice to meet you today. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, now, I, I know that you met with one of our intake counselors, uh, and I read over the um, the summary uh, that he provided, uh, and I wanted to, to follow up with you and begin with um, uh, asking how you're doing in the aftermath of your recent breakup. It seems that's what prompted you to seek therapy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was my mom asking me to come to therapy because of, I guess, her noticing my behavior after the breakup, but yeah, I guess that would be the event. Uh -huh. Okay. And um, do you have an idea of, of what your mom was noticing? I mean, I've definitely spent more time in my room after the breakup, which I feel like is pretty normal. Um, but yeah, just more to myself, I guess. Uh huh. Just keeping more to yourself. Yeah. For sure. Have you have you been feeling uh, sad um, or down? Since yeah, the, I mean, uh, since the breakup. Yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you would uh, tell me a little bit about this relationship and uh, how long you had dated and 
how things were going from your perspective and, and then what led to the breakup? Yeah, we dated for a couple of years, probably right around the two year mark. And I mean, for the most part, I thought it was pretty good. There was nothing, um, yeah, nothing too bad that happened in the relationship that would cause, I don't know, like an explosive, it wasn't like an explosive breakup or anything, but I think, I mean, my ex-girlfriend Sylvia was definitely more outgoing, I would say, and I'm definitely on the more quiet kind of introvert side, so I think any disagreements we had probably came there like she had really liked going out with friends I I mean preferred to stay in and um yeah I think we started to argue a little more when we started noticing that difference a little more okay so it, it sounds like you both began to notice some differences in your maybe in your personality or in your relational style that you preferred uh, to maybe be at home more or just the two of you and she had a preference for going out and being with groups and other people and and um, that neither one was exactly comfortable for the other um, neither preference I mean yours to her and hers to you and th and that's what led to having more conflict yeah because I think in the beginning, I think we liked dating someone that wasn't so similar to us. Like who wants to date the exact same person, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but then I think once it really started affecting our friendships, like she'd want to go on double dates all the time. Or um, for me, like I need a lot of time to myself, you know? And I think initially Sylvie felt like, oh yeah, that's fine. You can have that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the longer we dated, the more we noticed that it actually affected our like social dynamic with each other and with other people. So, yeah. So, um, so it sounds like maybe in the beginning, um, your relationship with Sylvie was, was pretty harmonious mm -hmm. um, that maybe you were even drawn to one another because your styles were different. Um, maybe you kind of liked her outgoing nature and she might have really appreciated your more, um, reserved style and quiet personality. Um, and then over time, you uh, noticed that it led to changes in your relationships with other people and with yeah. each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then how, how, did, um, how did it, it come up in the relationship that you decided about um, breaking up? I mean, I was willing to stay together, like Sylvia broke up with me. And I think for her, she's such a communal, like relational person, mm -hmm. even just outside of my relationship with her, right? Like, I think, and it's not even like I felt like she was going to leave me for someone else, or I felt like she was going to cheat or anything like that. I think okay. I still felt that discomfort with her wanting so much connection outside of our relationship, you know, and not in some like crazy controlling way. I think I just needed less of that than she did. And it just seemed like she needed a lot more uh, than that than I did. And I, I think I brought it up once and she was like, what's normal? Like to want connection with your friends, right? And I think so too, but I think it's just the level that she needed in comparison to how much I needed it. Cause it's not like I don't have any friends um but it's just I don't need to see them as often I guess um so it was conversations like that that I think eventually led to her going okay like this probably isn't gonna work then mm, okay yeah. so it was Sylvia's decision to break up and your conversations were about the differences in in the needs that you had to be around other people to socialize with other people and uh, that she needed more of that, and you preferred not quite so much, and so that difference led to the separation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds, Jay, like, like from your perspective, um, that 
you used the word difference, that, that Sylvia and I were different in our preferences for social time with other people. Mm -hmm. And um, that really stood out to me because it, it sounds like you are holding both needs, her needs and your needs, that you had certain needs and she had different needs, not better, not worse, a bit different. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess who am I to say, like, if it's better or worse to have a preference for seeing friends a lot. Um, and it's not like we would argue because I thought her way was better than mine. I think it was more just I was uncomfortable being around so many people all the time. And that's what was hard for me. It's not that, like, I minded that she had so many friends, you know, outside of the relationship. It's just I just didn't really have the capacity to join her all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and and uh, I'm interested to hear, Jay, about you, Med, because you mentioned um, that uh, your other friends, you know, that you have other friends who you spend time with. Would you be able to tell me a little bit about those relationships? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's mostly, it's a couple guys at work at the warehouse I'm at. We'll grab drinks sometimes. Um, but nothing crazy. Like, it's pretty, like, they're, I guess energy level and even just the way that they do friendships is pretty similar to me where they don't yeah you know, they're not like party animals or anything you know so those guys and then uh, just a couple high school buddies that like I grew up playing video games with that's we stay in contact that way so yeah all my friends I guess are pretty similar to me in that they're a little more low-key if I can say that um in the way that they live socially i guess mm -hmm. yeah so they're they're we might say a bit more compatible with your uh with your style with your personality yeah. and uh, and it sounds like you've had some um long-standing relationships you mentioned some guys who you knew from high school and you've continued to be friends and some guys that you know at work and you socialize with them yeah I mean I wouldn't say they're like my best friends or like it's not like the relationships are like so deep it's just there's never really been conflict mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. like why end the friendship right okay okay so there hasn't been any uh, conflict that would lead to the ending of your friendships yeah like with the high school guys you mentioned I had long-standing friendships. It's like, I wouldn't say they feel like brothers or anything, you know? Like, mm -hmm. they've been around for a long time and we enjoy doing similar things, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we're just guys and we've just been buddies since we were younger, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, now, speaking of, of brothers, uh, Jay, would, would you tell me a little bit about your family? Yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up mainly with my mom and stepdad, my parents, like my biological dad and my mom split um, when I was nine. And I have two older siblings from that marriage that they're, they're a few years older and they don't live at home. Um, I'm still at home with my mom and stepdad. Um, but the other two, they're, yeah, they're doing their own thing. And then um, I have a younger stepbrother that, I mean, I guess we're close. It's not like a bad relationship. We get along. Um, I would say I'm, I'm probably a little closer to my stepbrother than I am to my biological siblings. Um, I mean, things are fine with my mom and stepdad. Like, not really argue or anything. Um, wouldn't say they're the warmest people. Um, but yeah, they're not bad people. They're hardworking and yeah, that's kind of the family background I come from. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you you feel closer uh, to your stepbrother who's younger than to your biological siblings who are older and have left home and and live elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I think just in terms of life stage, my little brother Chris, he's nineteen, and 
I'm 22, so it's a little closer in age. The older ones are like closer to 30, so I think, okay. yeah, and they're not even at home, so mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And um, Jay, do you do you remember much about your parents' divorce? I mean, d divorce can have a lot of impacts on different members of the family. I'm interested to hear how it might have impacted you. I mean, I mean, to be clear, like, I don't have much of a relationship with my biological dad. And, um, I think that's probably one of the reasons my mom and dad had a divorce is that he was not the most connected to like me and my siblings um I'm sure it's more than that but I mean it it just goes to show like if I don't have a relationship with my biological dad and it's not like they divorced when I was like two I was a little older you know um I mean I don't remember a ton I know that they would fight a little bit um but I think my mom didn't want me and my siblings to see the fighting too much so um I don't remember being very surprised when the divorce was happening, but I think I was also too young to really understand what was happening, you know, but it never felt like a marriage, really. Like, looking back at it now, I'm like, oh, yeah, like, I kind of saw it coming. Like, the, the relationship never seemed um, not loving, I guess. Oh, that kind yeah. of sucks to say, but. Yeah, so it wasn't not very loving or warm or affectionate or close it kind of just kind of just seemed like they were in the house together and like mm -hmm. I mean I don't know I watch my parents my friends parents interact and it's like oh that looks a little different than like what I grew up with even like between my mom and um stepdad like it's not like that was that's the warmest relationship either mm -hmm. um but yeah mm -hmm. And, uh, and when did your uh, stepdad come, come into your life? Maybe like, oh, were you then? Uh, maybe like 10 or 11, like not so far or long after that okay. divorce. Yeah. Okay. And then maybe they got married when I was, I don't know, like 11 or 12. So he came in the picture when I was around 10 and then maybe like a year or so after they got married. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you feel like your relationship with both your mom and your stepdad, um, that it's okay, um, fair, fairly harmonious. It sounds like neither one is particularly close or warm or affectionate, but is okay. Is that fair to say? I mean, I would say I'm probably closer to my mom, just because, I mean, mom's been around longer and yeah my stepdad is I mean, he's not a bad guy but he's I wouldn't call him like mm -hmm. the happy-go-lucky mm -hmm. um yeah I don't know he just works really hard and mm -hmm. he's not like an ass or anything but he's not like I don't know super warm either okay uh-huh so he's not he's not to, to use your phrase, he's not an ass or anything, but um, it doesn't sound like you two spend much time together, or go to ball games or play video games or yeah, things like so that. not like a no like conflict, you know. Like we, he, both my mom and stepdad give me my space to do my thing, and mm -hmm. um, and there's just not much. To, I'm, I'm like a pretty good kid, you know. Like I don't give them any reason to argue with me you know like mm -hmm. um and I've always been a pretty like chill like well-behaved kid so there was never any reason for my mom or stepdad to like argue with me um so I don't know if that has more to do with me or just them being mellow too but well, yeah that, that's, a re that's a really good question Jay I think that's an important observation as as we come to understand your relation relationships and your uh, life um, that um, you wonder um, whether there might be some aspect that it's 
sort of your personality that's more kind of chill and mellow or if it's the other person's personality that's chill and mellow and or if there's some interaction between the two. I, I think that's a really um, important observation and something we'll want to talk more about as time goes on. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we'll have to end for today, Ajay, but thank you so much for coming in and I'll see you this time next week. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye for now. In the second session, Dr. Tisdale continues to explore key relationships in Jay's life. She looks more closely at Jay's cyclical maladaptive pattern, or CMP, in which he tends to avoid conflict with others at any cost. This includes his introject, or the way that he relates to himself. He tells Dr. Tisdale that he sometimes must suck it up and remain in uncomfortable situations instead of asserting himself to meet his needs. Empathic exploration is used throughout this process. Well, Jay, um, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me again. And um, I'm interested to know um, uh, if you had any. Um, thoughts or responses um, after our session last week? Yeah, I think one thing came to mind. Um, I don't talk about my family a ton. I think if anyone ever asked me about my family, it was probably Sylvia and um, it's interesting because the more I thought about the way I described my family to you, the more I remember that Sylvia always thought my dynamic with them was interesting as well. Um, so yeah, that came up. I remember she would make comments like, oh, like you don't spend a ton of time with your parents. Um, like, why is that? Or like, oh, like you don't really talk to your siblings at all. Like you talk to Chris because he's around more, but um, the two older ones you don't really talk to. So yeah, they're at a relationship. She would make comments like that, that I kind of just ignored and just thought we're like, okay, like whatever. But I think after mm -hmm. you and I have kind of talked about family that came up, but yeah, other than that, not really. So, so Sylvia would um, sometimes make observations about your relationships with your family and and Jay, I'm I'm interested to know. Um, do Do you recall then or now uh, wishing that you could spend more time with your, let's say, your siblings or your uh, parents? Uh, I mean, did, do you recall that at some time or now that you would wish to do that or would like to do that? I mean, I think any time I would spend time with my mom and stepdad, you know, like if they were to like, oh, let's go out to dinner or, you know, they would try things, you know, especially when I was a little younger. Mm -hmm. um, like it was just fine. Like, I guess they like were trying, but it was never, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. It was just fine. I guess that's kind of the best way to describe it. Like it wasn't bad. I wouldn't describe it as the most exciting thing either, you know, and okay. um, I kind of feel the same way about like my older siblings too. It was just like hmm. cordial, which I think, I think that was really weird to Sylvia. She's really close with their siblings. She was like, why the hell don't they hit you up to hang out or you know, stuff like that. And I think those questions did make me feel a little uncomfortable because I didn't really know how to answer, right? This is, I don't know, it was just my personal family experience and I've never been, I guess, observed, like you said, like no one has ever made observations about my family like that before. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess when you're dating, that happens a little more, right? So, yes. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And um, and on on that topic, uh, Jay, was was Sylvia your first uh, serious girlfriend, or had you had other 
relationships, dated other people in the past? I dated one girl in high school, but I mean, you're so young then, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, for like a few months in high school. But yeah, Sylvia was definitely like my first girlfriend. Like you are my partner. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And definitely like way more long term than the girl that I dated in high school. So Mm -hmm. yeah. So so I'm I'm hearing that that um you you haven't necessarily felt a desire to spend more time, let's say, with your older siblings, with your biological siblings. Um, that you all you use the word cordial, um, that you're cordial to one another, that there isn't any um conflict, like overt conflict. Uh, but just not a lot of mm, something, you know, but between you that would draw you to want to spend time together. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, it's pretty fair. Uh Uh-huh. And um, this might sound like a a kind of a strange question, but I'm I'm really interested to know if... um, if sometimes you shy away from spending time with people because you have some anxiety that you might have conflict. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've probably, not taking it that far in terms of like thinking about the conflict piece. Um, I don't disagree with that statement, but I think for me, I've probably only gone as far to think of me not being a very confrontational person, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I've never really tied it back to like, I don't know, like closer relationships and the relationship of conflict in that context um but yeah i hate conflict i think it's so unnecessary and mm-hmm. um petty a lot of the time when i see people in conflict mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. yeah it's not really my thing it's not your thing uh-huh well so if if it's um so we say it's not your thing conflict isn't your thing and you don't uh you don't appreciate when you see other couples or people having conflict um would it would it be accurate to say that there there might be a way in which you avoid conflict or avoid topics that might be might lead to conflict with another person i mean i guess the way I'm hearing that is like you go out of your way to avoid conflict which I would say yeah Mm -hmm. um like I don't know like in my friendships or even like dating Sylvie like she would do something that like was pretty irritating but not like horrible you know it wasn't like her trying to be like a bad person or like awful to me Mm -hmm. I kind of just let it go you know Uh um yeah, and even with friends, like if they're being, I don't know, like rude or, yeah, just like annoying, I kind of just let it pass. It's like, okay, like I, I'd rather suck it up and like be fine with that than like bring it up and I guess risk like them being offended. And I don't know, it's just being a whole thing, right? Being a whole thing. Uh huh. So you, you'd rather suck it up and, uh, and deal with it yourself rather than bring it into the relationship to see if it could be talked about uh, because your your thought is it might lead to a big old thing uh, and yeah. and this we do not want is a big old thing to happen mm-hmm. uh-huh. well so so when you um, when you do spend time with people um, 
uh, what is it like for you to um, to uh, initiate those plans? Does it usually is it usually the case that you would like suggest to the guys at work, hey, you guys want to go to happy hour after work, or if your high school friends, you guys want to come over on Saturday and play video games, would would it be the case they would typically initiate, or would you, or both of you? How how does that go? I mean, I think with the guys from high school, like I've just known them for so long, so I guess I'm a little more prone to reaching out to them. Like we just have a a flow to how we do our friendship. We're like mm-hmm. meet up on weekends or whatnot, right? So okay. um, reaching out to them does not require as much of me than it might if I'm reaching out to like a coworker or like new friends. So with the guys at work, like they're definitely the ones to initiate. Like let's go to the bar, let's go to the brewery, let's go grab some beers, you know and Mm-hmm. yeah I mean they're just they're nice guys and um I guess I've never really had to initiate at work they're very um yeah they're more prone to do that so I guess it's both so in one context I feel comfortable reaching out and then in my current like new work spot um yeah those guys kind of just make it happen I guess they make it happen okay <clears throat> well I, I'm hearing that when you feel comfortable, uh, perhaps when you feel like someone knows you and you know them um, and you're more relaxed, that you feel fine initiating, you feel comfortable initiating, getting together. And you said there's sort of a rhythm with your high school friends on the weekends, you hang out. Um, And that with your newer colleagues, uh, friends at work or, um, someone who's more recently in your life, um, that the initiation comes the other way. Like they would, uh, like the guys at work are usually the first ones to say, hey, let's go. There's a, this brewery just opened or, you know, let's go to happy hour and, and you're happy to go along. Yeah, no, totally. And I would say with that group, it definitely requires a little more of me to be in that space. Um, not that I need to like pretend to be someone else, but they're not wild. Like, like I said, like they're not like party animals. They're not wild dudes, but they're a little more outgoing than I am, you know? So I think I need to kind of muster up that type of energy when I'm with them. Whereas I think with my high school guys, Mm -hmm. like, they just know how I am. They know I'm a little quieter. They're also kind of on the quieter side. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I would say that. Mm-hmm. And so what is it like for you, Jay? I mean, I think your words were, I have to muster up a little more um, uh, maybe animation or engagement. What, what is that like for you in those kinds of social situations? I mean, I think I enjoy it. I think I just definitely hit a wall sooner than I would if I'm mm-hmm. with um, some of the guys I grew up with. Um, and I don't know if that's like me being anxious that like I can't keep up that amount of energy or if I, I don't know, start to feel like I might like not belong as much as the other guys not because they make me feel that way, but just because, like, I don't know, when you, like, try to muster up energy for a certain amount of time, you're like, oh, like, how long can I keep this up for, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's enjoyable, and then I think within, like, an hour and a half or two hours, I'm like, okay, look, I don't know if I could um, do this for much longer. Uh-huh. It's, it's enjoyable until it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, and then one, one last question for today, um, Jay, I'm interested to, to hear when you're in these social situations and you're realizing, oh, I think I'm, my tank's kind of running low, you know, I'm running low on, on fuel 
Um, and do, do you ever find yourself wondering, like, what will the other guys think about you if you say, hey, I'm going to go, or I think that's, you know, all for tonight or something like that? Do you ever wonder about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's funny you ask that because that kind of just goes back to the conflict thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd rather just suck it up. You know, like I stick around. I don't just leave when I, I very often want to leave sooner than I do, but because I don't want to, maybe it's less conflict and more like disappointing the guys. I kind of just suck it up and stick around and okay. like, yeah, <laughs> I'd rather just like feel really tired at the end of this than like, I don't know, disappoint the guys or. Okay. Okay, yeah. so you'd rather, there's that phrase again, you'd rather suck it up than disappoint the guys. Yeah, <laughs> and not that, like, I feel like they would not ask me to come out again, but, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I guess there's, like, a kind of people-pleaser part of me mm. uh, that comes out in different settings. Okay, yeah. all right, it's important to know. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, we've reached the end of our time for today, uh, Jay. And uh, so I'll look forward to seeing you next week then at this time. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye bye for now. At the midpoint of their counseling work, Dr. Tisdale evaluates Jay's progress. She summarizes the relational challenges that brought Jay to therapy and then gives him an opportunity to discuss his observations about the process so far. Jay articulates key learning points he has gained from counseling and also a new behavior he recently instigated with some of his colleagues at work. Um, I've, been, I've been thinking about um, some things, um, Jay, and I, I thought I'd bring them up to you and we could um, have some conversation about it. Um, I I realized uh, coming into our session today that we've been meeting um, for a couple of months now. And um, I know that therapy is a a relatively new experience for you. And um, that we've been talking a lot about your relationships and that what brought you to, to therapy was uh, the breakup of your relationship with um, Sylvia. And we've also talked about your friendships with guys at work and guys you knew from high school and also your family relationships growing up. And, and we've noted together that um, they were rather distant, we might say. Um, and um, there wasn't a lot of warmth Uh, or affection or closeness um, in those relationships. And we've begun to look at the impact that that had on you and without even realizing it uh, necessarily, that that, uh, these experiences early on had had a lasting influence on you. Um, And I remember us talking about how um, Sylvia had made some observations about your family relationships and with your older siblings, with your biological siblings, and um, that you didn't seem to spend much time with them. And I remember you telling me when, when she said that, you, you uh, were s- sort of a little bit offended and uh, didn't really like that observation, as I recall. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so um, we have been able to begin to connect these times of your life with how your relationships are now. Um, and um, I know we talked last week about your... Um, decision or your plan, we talked about this together, that you were going to possibly uh, do something very new 
very new experience um, and initiate um, hanging out with some of the guys at work. And so I'm interested to hear if, if you had an opportunity to do that and what was that like for you? Yeah, for sure. And I think, yeah, definitely new experience. I think, I mean, you and I have talked about me feeling a little more comfortable with initiating with my high school buddies, but <clears throat> yeah, with the guys at the warehouse, it was definitely all, always the other other guys uh, reaching out to, to go out. But yeah, this past week, I texted a few of the guys. It's like, hey, like, I had found out about a new brewery on Instagram and let's check it out, you know, shot the text um figured why not you know and yeah it was cool I mean <clears throat> I think because all of us had already gone out a few times I mean the response was as you would expect like yeah hell yeah let's do it you know like why wouldn't it be that but um one of the guys texted me separately I was like hey that's like that's new you know like it's usually one of us texting the group and I tried not to like, you know, give him too much, but I was like, I mean, I figured like, you know, I just pretended like I found, I found this new spot. I figured like I'd introduce the guys, you know, kind of just left it at that. But I think, yeah, even my buddy felt mm -hmm. the shift in me initiating. And I mean, I, I struggled to call it taking a risk because what are the, I'm not going to say no, you know, but I think mm -hmm. um, it is new for me. So it is. New. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's cool. and, and what was it like for your buddy to notice and and to text you and say hey jay i i uh you know it's usually one of us saying this so this is new for you what was that like for him to notice that what is it like? oh i was getting that text was so nerve-wracking at first like i've been exposed you know um it kind of felt like therapy in in a way um or like oh you noticed that like i was hoping you wouldn't you know mm -hmm. um but it was fine you know played it off as just just found the new spot you know played it off as cool as i could um but yeah that was kind of a funny text to get but yeah he kind of left it at that he didn't bother me too much about it after he didn't bother you too much about it uh-huh yeah so it sounds like maybe you had mixed feelings about his noticing it and saying something on text like oh no I've been found out and and I I want to take particular note you said it was kind of like therapy and um and so I, I'd like to follow up with that Jay and ask you you know what what has it been like for you with me here in therapy I mean we've been talking about a lot of things about your life and I know that you don't share very much with very many people so um, I'm remembering back to the very beginning when you um, made a comment about um, observations you know that Sylvia made observations about your family and I couldn't help but even back then think I wonder if Jay's wondering about observations I might be making so I would really welcome hearing about your experience of our relationship and um, and what that's been like for you yeah I mean honestly I feel like my hesitation with therapy or even, even just opening up to people has been like you're gonna read too much into this you're gonna try to um make this deeper than it actually is you know and even with that's kind of how it felt when sylvia would make those observations or make comments right i was like what the hell like what do you mean by that you know like it's fine like it's not like there's anything like that tumultuous happening at home it's not like i have a bad relationship with my family members you and i are fine like what's the big deal you know and mm -hmm. i think even coming into therapy with you i, I had a lot of those thoughts like what the hell does my family have to do with my breakup you know like I'm coming in for like I'm sad because I broke up or I got broken up with um 
how does this relate at all to my family, you know? And I think, mm. like, the more and more we meet, I think I'm realizing, like, one, like, the different domains of relationships I have are probably a little more connected than I think they are. Um, like, my hesitance to reach out to my buddies at work is probably pretty related to, like, my relationship with my siblings and even just, like, my relationship with my parents um or even like me hitting a wall <clears throat> when I'm hanging out with my my guy friends I think before it was like oh I'm so tired or like you know but I'm realizing like looking back at some of those hangouts I would shut down when they would start asking questions oh. and that's something I've realized too is I think I pinned it on oh, it's been a couple hours. Oh, like it's after work. It's late. We had a long day at the warehouse. And I'm realizing like, no, like maybe they wouldn't ask the same way Sylvie did, you know, as like a girlfriend would ask. But it's a lot of similar observations and questions. They'd ask me about my siblings, ask me about like my folks. And I think I felt a lot of the similar discomfort I felt when Sylvia would ask, you know, and I kind of just check out to be honest like I wouldn't ever really give a straight answer I'd kind of just like I mean it is what it is whatever like you know and I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I think yeah very I think those are really important new awarenesses that you have Jay and and I want to go back though and say I really appreciate your honesty just now in telling me that in the beginning you wonder what the hell does my family have to do with my breakup with Sylvia? And, um, you know, thanks for not saying that at the time, but um, I really appreciate your honesty and um, that that is how you felt at the time. And, uh, and even more, I think a reflection of the strength that you have of perseverance, that you persevered and you kept coming to therapy, even though, it wasn't at all clear to you how all this was going to connect up. Um, and in these months, you've been able to make these, I think, very important connections um, with your experience of your family and then your experience with even the guys at work and, um, and this, this um, phrase you use that you would check out. You know, um, and you would, at the time, you might have told yourself, oh, it's late, you know, I'm tired, I've, you know, had too many beers or whatever, you know, or they've had too many beers. Um, and uh, now you're realizing that, that there was a, kind of a shutdown inside of yourself that was happening. Um, and you've been able now to pay close attention to that yeah. um, in, uh, in your experiences now in social relationships. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think the hardest thing for me to admit has been, I've always assumed that if you're negatively affected by your family, something really gnarly would have had to happen growing up. You know, I mean, divorce sucks, you know, but it's not like it happened because my like, my dad is abusive towards us or, you know, it's nothing, no, nothing crazy like that. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. But I've kind of had to confront this reality that like, just because I don't have like a ton of conflict or trauma from my upbringing doesn't mean that my upbringing hasn't affected the way I relate to others I guess um mm -hmm. I always had this assumption that like I would have to have yeah something really traumatic happen for that to negatively affect the way I relate to people I date or you know my buddies but it's really like I mean you and I have talked about it like I don't have like that strong of a connection to anyone in my family right so why wouldn't that affect the way I relate to, to new people um so yeah I think that's been pretty tricky to I guess come to peace with um or come to terms with um just because I I don't like being dramatic I don't like the conflict I don't like the drama of like 
oh, my family did this to me or like, you know, like I don't want to blame my family for anything. And I think that's where a lot of it comes from. Um, but at the end of the day, like it has affected me, right? Um, and that's what you and I have talked about a lot. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Well, that, I think that's a, that's a very, another very important awareness that you've had, Jay. And I think a very poignant note for us to close on today um, is that um, perhaps even without knowing it, you had uh, thought, well, for your family life to have affected you, there needed to be some um, explicit or overt kind of trauma. Um, and what we've, what we've learned is that the absence of something um, can also have an impact yeah. on uh, on a person as you have seen with your uh, with your life and that our work here isn't to blame your parents or to blame any one person our work here is to understand yeah and um, and I think that's that's always been what you have voiced um, and not wanting to blame them you know they are who they are you are who you are yeah um, totally we're we're here to learn about uh, how all of that came to be and um who you want to be in your future yes so we'll keep we'll keep working toward that looking forward to it <laughs> okay yeah it's been quite a journey but yeah it's good yes yes it has i agree and uh, i'll look forward to seeing you next time likewise thanks for having me mm -hmm. bye bye Well, thank you, Dr. Tisdale. Thank you so much for, uh, for this wonderful uh, role play, uh, this, uh, the video demonstration of this really exciting model, uh, which you've really brought to life for us. Uh, so I just have some questions for you uh, and just kind of want to get your thoughts. Uh, so what were some of your initial thoughts about working with Jay and using TLDP in your counseling work with him? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that's a very important question. Um, as uh, with any therapeutic modality, um, there are selection criteria that you want to think through as a therapist about whether um, what the, the patient is presenting with is a good fit for what the model intends or what the approach intends. So with Jay, I was very mindful that he um, had had a recent breakup of a relationship um, and in our initial session, I was assessing um, how well he might be able to form and maintain a relationship with me such that we could explore together the uh, roots of um, uh, this pattern as it might emerge um, and uh, how that got started and what was keeping it going. Um, so I was listening very carefully um, for um, those elements in deciding to utilize TLDP with Jay. Okay, thank you. So Jay discussed some of his relational dynamics with phrases like needing to suck it up and hitting a wall when spending time with people he was not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So tell us how you helped Jay better understand the impact of these relational dynamics in his life. Mm -hmm. Well, that's um, also uh, very important question with TLDP um, and has to do with the uh, formulation um, as we are um, gaining information about the patient's life, present life and past um, history. Um, the um, aspects of the TLDP formulation of assessment and conceptualization and treatment planning become quite important. Um, and for the assessment, um, we want to um, listen very attentively to the words that the patient uses to describe their experience. Um, I'm also listening for any themes that seem to emerge um, that uh, echo relational patterns um, in the present um, with their 
uh, relationships in their history with family, for example. Uh, and also, um, what I gain during the um, initial sessions helps to inform uh, the treatment planning. In TLDP, we maintain um, a focused line of inquiry on what emerges as the core relational pattern. In TLDP, we call it the cyclical maladaptive pattern. Um, that essentially means the patient is not experiencing their relationships in as satisfying of ways as they might wish to, and they don't really know why. Um, so uh, together, that's what we'll find out. Okay. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned C CMP because it is so important uh, to TLDP, as you said. Uh, so what were some of the, the cyclical maladaptive patterns of J as you experienced them? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it, one of the aspects of the CMP are the what we call the acts of the self toward others. Mm -hmm. um, and what I heard in Jay's um, uh, description of his own experience, he tended to be um, reticent, uh, reluctant, even a bit avoidant at mm -hmm. times. Um, he might not have thought of it that way when we began therapy, but as uh, time moved on, he could see uh, some of that. Um, we also wanted to identify uh, the, the uh, expectations that Jay had of others. And um, in Jay's uh, case, he would expect um, others to um, not necessarily notice him. Um, he was very intent on, uh, on avoiding conflict of any kind with anyone, uh, and so he would tend um, to hold things to himself and become very compliant with others because his expectation was that they might reject him um, and become angry at him if he were to be honest. Um, and um, something that we call the interject um, is the way that a person relates to themselves. Uh, and what I noticed with Jay is he would use phrases like suck it up very often. Well, if this happens, I just need to suck it up. You know, if my buddies at work want to stay out, later than I'm comfortable, I just have to suck it up. Um, so I could sense that to mean that Jay was rather hard on himself um, and critical of himself and, and in a sense blamed himself um, when it may be that he was tired and ready to go home, but he didn't feel comfortable saying that. So in a complete TLDP therapy experience, how might you have addressed the cultural differences between you and Jay? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the um, cultural conceptualization is very important in, in TLDP uh, and involves essentially four, um, four aspects. One is the culture of the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so there are any number of individual and cultural differences. Um, distinctions that Jay has, his um, Asian background, his family context, uh, his being from a divorced family. Um, mm -hmm. So those are just some examples. Um, the other aspect is um, the therapist's um, cultural context. And so for myself, um, being aware of um, what has influenced me in my development, and particularly what has influenced what we call in TLDP our internal working model, which is an unconscious um, internalization of relationships such that it influences the way that we enter into relationships with others, and again, without us being aware of it. Um, the third aspect is um, the, the context of the setting where we are. Um, and so if, if the therapy takes place in community mental health or private practice or in a hospital outpatient clinic, um, there are um, 
cultural context variables related to those settings that we, I would want to be aware of. And then fourthly, it's the interaction of all of those. Um, and so as a therapist, I believe we always want to be mindful. I think this is, I think Levinson has articulated a very useful framework um, for reflecting on culture. Um, and so um, had we had the whole 26 sessions uh, to illustrate here, um, I would have taken up each of those um, with Jay, uh, particularly the influence of his cultural background. We did speak a um, fair amount about his family, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and um, then, and I would have addressed the setting as well. Okay. Now, transference and countertransference are vital to TLDP. How are these elements apparent in your work with Jay? Mm -hmm. Right, so um, transference and countertransference um, are uh, are a part of any analytically oriented um, work in therapy or conceptualization. Um, in Jay's case, um, I did sense, um, which is in TLDP, you want to be aware of all the pushes and pulls that you're feeling in relation to your patient. Some patients pull or push us to be um, more involved, to grant them extra time, um, to give them solutions. So we want to be very attentive to those pushes and pulls. What I sensed from Jay in the beginning um, was his, his reticence and his reluctance. Um, I was very aware of um, proceeding gently and, um, and uh, incrementally in asking him to speak about himself. Um, he hadn't been in therapy before, and so I was very aware of that, um, as well as the sense I had uh, very early in the treatment that um, he did not share himself very readily with others. Um, I also picked up on um, Jay's uh, awareness of being observed by me, um, and uh, he connects that feeling of being observed um, to his previous girlfriend, and I bring it in to the last session and asking him about our relationship, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the tenor of his voice sort of went up, mm -hmm. his eyebrows lifted, so I had an awareness that he might have felt um, observed in perhaps exactly. not as positive a way. So, um, so my countertransference was to, um, to proceed uh, I would say uh, gently and organically um, with him and um, follow him in uh, wherever he wanted to go in each session, given our focus on his relationships. Exactly, exactly. So more broadly, uh, if you would uh, discuss the three theoretical bases of TLDP. TLDP um, was developed by Hannah Levinson, and uh, what she has woven together um, are the theories of uh, attachment, um, interpersonal theory, and emotion-focused change theory. Um, attachment theory is utilized as the uh, foundation of how we understand motivation, that we're all um, motivated for connection with others, and throughout um, our early life, um, we develop characteristic attachment styles. Um, some of us are blessed to have a secure attachment where others um, are a safe haven, a secure base. But most of us have some um, impact from our early life that may leave us feeling anxious uh, or avoidant uh, or ambivalent about connections um, or in some cases um, disorganized because of a particularly chaotic mm -hmm. background. Um, interpersonal theory uh, brings us the, the medium of the work or the method of the work. Um, the relationship between the therapist and patient um, becomes the, um, the context in which the patient will hopefully experience new um, ways of relating uh, to themselves and others a new understanding of their life um, within themselves and in their uh, relationships with others. And, um, and then lastly, the emotion 
of focus uh, change theory um, really undergirds the process of the therapy. You know, Freud, uh, back in the early 1900s, uh, said that insight was not enough, um, that we needed both insight, so we'll translate that to new understanding, and Freud said we also need the affect. We need to be able to access the affect that goes with our experience, and there is uh, the new experience of TLD. Um, so we're looking for ways um, or occasions where the past, in terms of affect, comes alive in the present. And often we may experience it as, gosh, this seems um, exaggerated or this seems sort of over the top. Well, it's not if we look for where did this originate. Um, and so when we have access to that affect, that's when change. Um, can happen in um, a more lasting way. So we have a, a attachment theory and personal theory and emotion focused uh, change theory that's a very powerful combination. So what are the main strategies and interventions of the TLDP model? Mm -hmm. Well the beauty of TLDP um, is that uh, a therapist can um, utilize interventions from any modality of therapy. Um, they, they can be CBT interventions, Gestalt interventions, um, interventions that highlight um, difference in um, structure and uh, from structural family therapy and understanding family dynamics. Um, a therapist can also utilize um, uh, hobbies or interest of the patient's life to set the to set the stage or set the opportunity for some new understanding or new experience to um, to be felt and had by the patient. So interventions just cover the whole waterfront. Mm -hmm. So that leaves a lot of uh, creativity. Mm -hmm on the part of the, for the therapist. So those are some examples of interventions. Mm -hmm. um, and then as to the, the um, strategies, mm -hmm. um, they cluster around um, several um, important areas. Um, the first uh, has to do with maintaining the therapeutic relationship, and every trained therapist um, knows about this to demonstrate that you're listening receptively that you're picking up on the unique language that a patient uses to describe uh, their experience. We're also helping our patients to process emotion. Um, so I'm listening to the emotions that are being expressed, and I'm listening for the emotions that aren't being expressed. Uh, and this comes into the um, work with the goal of a new experience internally, where the patient's affective life is able to be opened up. Um, and um, I also want to um, mention the empathic exploration. And again, you know, therapists in, in our early training um, learn this and it's reinforced uh, throughout um, that we want to demonstrate um, our uh, felt sense of what a patient um, is describing. Um, and, um, and offer our reflections on that. Um, as in any short-term therapy, there's a focused line of inquiry, and in TLDP, it's, it is the relationship um, pattern that the patient has, and so um, we're listening. This cyclic, cyclical pattern is what informs the treatment focus um, in every session and also the treatment planning um, and the goals, uh, and the CMP, of course. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, the relationship with the therapist is the medium of change. This is how we are looking for change to come about, um, is through our relationship. Um, the belief is that the patient's dynamics, whatever they are, will come into the therapy relationship. And uh, so at one point, I asked uh, Jay what, um, he might be wondering I'm thinking or feeling about him. Mm -hmm. um, now that's often very new for um, student uh, therapists when um, I'm training in this, them in this model. 
um, we're not very used to asking our patients what they think that we might be thinking about them, but this is very important to TLDP. And, uh, and then in promoting change, we utilize what are called process directives, um, which have to do with an, um, a proactive way that a patient might be able to have a new experience. For example, with Jay, I suggested he take the initiative to ask his buddies out um, for a drink and to see what is that like for the patient, um, especially the impact that has on their self-esteem and sense of self, and how it influences the way they experience uh, other people. Um, and in every um, short-term or time-limited therapy, that, that issue of time is always in um, our mind, mm -hmm. and uh, so we want to make every session count. Exactly, exactly. Well, Dr. Tisto, you have brought your expertise as a therapist uh, on full display in your video with Jay, um, but you are also an instructor of TLDP in your own classroom. And so, what what would you recommend for uh, instructors or even students who are watching this video who really want to learn more uh, about this model? What kind of recommendations would you have for them? Mm -hmm. Well, I I'm, I'm, um, want to say first, um, I'm very grateful that you're including this in your DVD series of therapies. Um, uh, TLDP um, is utilized, um, I know, in uh, college counseling centers, um, at the VA, um, and uh, I think it, it has a, um, uh, a potential for great impact in a person's life. And as with any short-term therapy, much of the change happens after mm -hmm. the therapy ends. Um, and so what we want to, um, to hopefully have happen is for our patients to be introduced to a new way of noticing their internal and interpersonal life um, and to recognize what a difference a new experience can make to them, how it opens up new possibilities where these cyclical maladaptive patterns tend to shut things down um, for us when we're caught in them. Um, and so I think that in um, an introduction or survey class of theories and therapies, um, this would be a, a great way to introduce students to this. Um, of course, we have a course in TLDP in our program which could be added to any clinical program at a master's or doctoral level. And, um, and there are places that students can get trained uh, in this model, um, sometimes in the context of their, um, their practicum or employment, and uh, would encourage them to seek that out too. Well, Dr. Tizzle, thank you so much for uh, sharing your, your wisdom through your uh, video with Jay, but also uh, in this Q&A at the end. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Dr. Bledsoe. Thank you so much.